So I'm here with Elizabeth Halliday, part of Emerging Voices Project, and George Lamb, composer from our project. And our talk today is funded partially by New Music USA's MetLife Creative Connections program, which is awesome. So thank you. Um, and we're in Elizabeth's house. It's the holidays, um, which is cool. Um, it actually is kind of smoky in here. So. <laughs> because uh, we just ate dinner. Why don't we just jump in with your piece, Persistence of Smoke? Sure. Um, gosh, I mean, it's, uh, it's been maybe two years now since I wrote that piece, something like that. Uh, that, was, that was the dissertation piece? Yeah, so the Persistence of Smoke uh, is a chamber opera, about an hour long uh, chamber opera, that is a documentary opera, that's why I called it, and that was my dissertation at Duke. University where I um, got my PhD in 2011, and the premise of the project was to start um, start writing an opera not by writing an original story or uh, looking through different source material to find what to adapt, but to do interviews uh, with people in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I talked to 14 different individuals connected to these buildings. Uh, that were former cigarette factories in Durham. Uh, Durham, North Carolina used to be a tobacco town, uh, mm -hmm. really what built Durham. And the, in the 60s through the 90s, uh, when cancer uh, came out as something that was caused by tobacco, it had a, tobacco had a slow death out of town. So the town has been sort of trying to reinvent itself as something else um, the whole time. And so uh, in the meantime, you have all these empty cigarette warehouses and factories and so they just sit in downtown and I thought they were really interesting and really close to campus and I really wanted to do a piece about them so I interviewed 14 people that were connected to these to these uh, buildings some uh, people that used to work there some people that work there now some people that are city planners architects uh, and, and business people and after I amassed all this documentary material I gave it over to um, a playwright John Justice who fashioned the libretto out of it, and then um, I wrote the opera on the libretto, and then we staged it in the former um, former factory that made cotton bags for loose leaf tobacco. Oh, wow. So it was sort of a whole idea of, a, of a, a project that really takes Durham as its center. I mean, I feel yeah. like a lot of the, um, a lot of the academic work that comes out of Duke, especially from the music department, didn't really have anything to do with Durham at all, and so I thought that would be a nice opportunity, uh, a niche to to do a project that would make it stand out and have it be really related to to the town. And I mean, that's the sort of that was the first project that really turned me on to thinking about connecting uh, sort of a documentary aspect to writing music to to write a piece that is very intimately connected with a subject of person, a people, a place, and then performing that in a similar place that echoes all those themes. Um, so that was the first one that, that, I, uh, that I did. Was there any particular path to like, choosing that outside of like, noticing the factories? Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I've always liked buildings. <clears throat> I still like buildings. There's something about looking at different buildings, old and new, that does something to me. Uh, I am also a very visual person, and I, I've, you know, and I, I mean, I can't really use any technical terms to describe what what I see. But you know, there's something <laughs> about buildings and, and these brick buildings that just looks really cool. So, um, and I see them pretty much every day, um, and so that was pretty much the premise. And I also feel like it represents for the town of Durham this problem, um, or like at least, yeah, it's this problem or conflict between a, a whole, whole bunch of issues. So you have, um, you know, some of these buildings being redeveloped for uh, really high, high quality class A office spaces and condos and high end condos. And, but it's a neighborhood that is very much working class, poor working class, um, a lot of African American population in that neighborhood. Uh, so there's always, you know, there's always been a racial divide in Durham, and that has been t heightened by uh, gentrification more and more. And so these buildings, I mean, they, they, for me, they embodied all those things, and I thought that would be a really interesting way to, to look at these things, for me at least, and then 
to know more about this place that I have lived there for four years um, and, and didn't think too much about it. So, long answer to, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it was, I, I don't know, I was driving one day and I saw these buildings, I said, okay, let's do that. So, I never knew that you performed it in the factory. Yeah. In the a factory, or the cob factory? Uh, it was a, a, it was a mill. Oh. Uh, and also, I think it made it was a textile mill that made bags for the tobacco, and okay. it's called Golden Belt. So now it's been turned into uh, artist studios and office spaces okay. and some retail. Um, but yeah, that's 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 where it was. And if you uh, look it up on, on look up YouTube, uh, Persistence of Smoke, or go to my website, you'll see a clip of the opera inside the warehouse. Mm -hmm. And it's all exposed brick, you know, uh, uh, new windows, but, you know, it's this, uh, this space, this retail space that is about to be turned into, you know, a boutique or something like that. But for the, for the four months that we, um, for the four months prior to the show day, you know, that, that was sitting empty. So, um, and the, the idea of doing a site-specific performance project in a place that is temporary uh, that's about to be a transition to something else that you yeah. can't ever repeat again because it just doesn't exist. Uh, was pretty exciting. That's cool. You know, so I, I really like that idea of it. Um, but but yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's it was a very much of a challenge to get it all together, uh, and for the first time, really playing producer and trying to <laughs> put this whole opera together. Um, a lot of work. Yeah. yeah, but the but but the the end goal, the idea of doing that site specific project, that's connected to Durham in so many ways, uh, was always what was driving it. You know, I was really excited when, whenever I was thinking about that, you know. But, yeah, so that's... The piece you wrote for us, uh, The Person in the Room Wishes to be Left Alone, is a sort of in that documentary vein also. Um, yeah, yeah, non-fiction, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, because the, the, the title from that piece becomes from two different characters, one real life, um, what was the writer's name? Barbara Mark Follett. Yeah, Barbara Follett and Margaret? Margot. 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 Ten. Ten bomb. I always read the program notes when I have to <laughs> do it. Um, both of which are sort of art artistic people, maybe they're both writers? Um, Margot writers? Yeah, yeah Margot was a writer, yeah. And both had this sort of urge to run away from society. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe you could talk about how the, the the text for that was created. Sure. So it began with uh, my high school friend, uh, Aaron McGee, who I on and off have been communicating with, but not really, but we're Facebook friends, like a lot of our high school friends who we somewhat yeah. keep up with and not really. Um, but one day, I think she posted on her Facebook page this story um, the, from an online journal about Barbara Follett. This, a uh, child prodigy writer who published a you know New York Times bestselling novel uh, by the time she was I mean she was just I, I don't know really young I don't want to make up a, an age and then have it, but really young I don't know I want to say like six or seven something like that. yeah I remember being yeah really young. yeah and, and it was uh, published by Random House and uh, her parents were really encouraging her uh, to to write write more you know she would go into her room and type and. Uh, using a typewriter and just just type out this the uh, her writing, and um, and so she continued writing I believe, and then she published a few more things. But by the time she was uh, she she became twenty twenty one. I think she met uh, someone in Boston, and they lived together. And some mysterious circumstances, she disappeared. Uh, when I think around she was 22, 23 or something like that and like her um, her partner or boyfriend didn't contact her mom for like a few weeks so it was all very you know mysterious um, but but the fact was that you know she just uh, left you know yeah. she just took off and uh, that idea I thought was really interesting I was thinking is this Operatic, I don't know. Like maybe uh, it's not much of a plot, or but it's a very interesting idea to start with. This, you know, this uh, young woman who, for a host of different reasons that you can imagine, 
life became so much or so much to deal with or something to that effect that you know it had something cataclysmic had to have happened to change and you know, change it all at the same time by disappearing, killing herself, whatever. Um, but but that idea of 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 her was really interesting to me. So um, when you guys asked me for a piece, I went to my um, longtime collaborator Benjamin Rogers, who is a writer based in Chicago, and I pitched the band. I was like, well, there's a piece for uh, for the saxophone and voice duo that they are hoping would have would conform to the theme of childhood and loss of innocence and um, and I thought about that theme a lot, it's just, you know, at, at the onset of thinking about it, it wasn't grabbing me as much. But when I read the story, I was like, okay, like, this is something that yeah. I would be interested in, you know, something that has to do with this recluse uh, a child writer. Um, so I gave it to Ben, and Ben thought about it for a long time and came <laughs> back with, well, why don't, I, I loved the Royal Tenenbaums, uh, this movie by Wes Anderson, and um, so this uh, character Margot Tannenbaum, who was played by uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, is a similar character. You know, she she's very much a uh, um, introvert, and mm -hmm. she is a writer. And for you know, for four weeks or something in her teenage years, she disappeared to go look for her biological parents because she was adopted by the Tannenbaums. And when she came back, she had two fingers missing. You know, this, but it's that's definitely a more a comical, a lighthearted read on on that theme. But something about these two stories spoke to Ben, and so he wrote uh, he wrote the text. And then uh, the only other sort of idea I had put into his head was that these should be miniatures because I haven't done miniatures in a while. I I like them. They're, yeah. they're fun to write. <laughs> uh, because you know you you get you get just one idea you don't have to develop it too much but um, but you ha it has to be a it has to be a good enough idea that can sustain itself for a short amount of time and yeah. then you move on and it's it's a it's a nice way for me to get something out and this was especially um, pretty much right after I finished that long opera the the hour long thing which is the, like the longest thing I ever written. Yeah. Um, so I just need something <laughs> yeah, to opposite. yeah. So I just need something to like you know get it out. So, but yeah. So that was the beginning of the piece. And the text Benjamin wrote is really cool. It's very like miniature, simple. There's like just five very lines sparse. of simple words. It's, it's six six miniatures in total. Right, prologue and five chapters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he called them. And the whole um, thing is what seven minutes long. Ten. It's like ten. Ten. Yeah. I think every piece we wind up doing is like ten minutes. Ten minutes. And we, we always yeah. think there's something else. <laughs> it's yeah. twenty minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the text is very sparse. But it's cool. Yeah, I mean that's I think that's part of Ben's voice. It, um, especially in the yeah, in the things that we've done. It's very um, emotional and and very um, the words are sparse, but you know, it's potent. A lot of the words are very potent and and yeah weighty. Uh, so it was it was fun to set to to music. Yeah. How did you start working with them? Because uh, you've done like several pieces sure. together. Yeah. So I met him through um, our all, all of our mutual friends, Robert Merrill, who um, who I met at Peabody <coughs> Conservatory where, uh, when I. And he, he had commissioned he commissioned a piece from me for his master's recital. This is back in two thousand four, and I did that. Um, that's right, I did that, and then that was a, on a, a poem by Mark Doty. And then I believe you know we were going to work on a second piece, and he suggested working with um, his friend from undergrad, Ben Rogers, who's a writer. So. I met Ben uh, in Boston because he was going to Simmons at the time to finish his uh, Master of Life of Science. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked, and that was the first piece that we did, which was another set of miniatures. That was the first set of miniatures called We Two Boys. It's a uh, five, yeah. five movement, something like that, for violin and baritone voice. So kind of a similar yeah. piece, you know, yeah. single voice instrument plus voice. Um, and in fact, a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of things remind. Well, while, while I was writing the piece for you guys, you know, it, it reminded me a lot of the things I was thinking about for that piece as well. Especially the fast movement with the. There's a there's a movement in the, we two boys um, that, 
uh, the violin actually for the whole time. It's very fast and rhythmic, similar to 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 um, your piece, but uh, the violin stays pitch wise below the baritone. Yeah. Um, so they're all very close and rhythmic, um, and and so yeah. I mean, there was a lot of thinking on my part of like, oh yeah, this is reminding me of the same kind of things I was I was working on. But now, you know, whatever, six years later, hopefully, yeah. hopefully grew up a, a little bit. And, <laughs> Has yeah. it changed how you work together? Yeah. You know, I, it's always a back and forth. He would send me things and then I would talk to him about it. But, you know, I, I think I was always pretty inadequate in describing what I want. <laughs> so it just ends up with me babbling like, well, you know, I would have died. Um, but I think after, you know, these five or six pieces now, I, I can get at a better way of describing what I want. Um, yeah. And I think he hopefully also, you know, uh, uh, gets me more. So in that way, it's, it's different and hopefully better. I don't know much about the process, of, like how a composer would work with a librettist. So yeah. um, would he typically, it sounds like he would make revisions of the text yeah. for you? It, de it depends on what the project is, and depends, of course, the collaborators, but yeah. Um, yeah, he would pretty much give me sketches, and I would, sometimes I would just edit them and send it back to him to see, what do you think about this? If you're okay, you're okay, you know. Is this before okay. any music's written? For me, yeah. For me. That's, I, I, do you always I, have that, the text I'd like to have, uh, yeah. Then I can, then I can do things with it, yeah. So the revisions are more of like, like the style or the plot. Uh, or do you style have musical or ideas of well, if it's a if it's a both, yeah. I mean, I like to think that I've developed a pretty good sense of what I like and what responds what I respond to in terms of text or libretto, um, and and if it's you know, and I can so I can pretty. Uh, I can pretty accurately describe how I want the text to go so that I can write some music to it. I mean, for me, there are a lot of different things that uh, make me want to write, want to set these words to music, you know. Um, so it's getting at those things. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all very vague, I know, but it's, it's, it's a revision process on, yeah, both style and plot. Um, now, if you're talking about an opera, you know, the general plot probably has is set if it's a plotful opera. Uh, so the skeleton of what happens next, you know, what happens when, and then, and then what happens, and then what happens, that's all set. Um, so I mean, the, the discussion on plot might be in the more of the beginning of the, of the process. But you know, uh, um, but yeah, sometimes I was like, you know, let's just have more words here, or let's just have another quartet or whatever, you know, in this moment, so yeah. Back and forth, and then once it's done, then I can have like a copy of it. Then I'll start writing music to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Robert Merrill, who you mentioned, is a singer in the group Rhymes with Opera, with George and Elizabeth. That we are both in. Yeah, um, which is a very cool uh, new opera company, and you guys do a lot of this sort of um, similar things to what you described in your bio of, of being like. I don't know, it's sort of this like, broad idea of like, like alternative venues like being really tightened into the community that you're doing something in. Um, but I, I'd love to have you guys talk about that group, like how, how it formed and, and what your goals are with it. Oh, well the timing is excellent because we have a performance on December 13th <laughs> in New York and December 15th in Baltimore. Um, Plug. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I know it, it initially formed as just George and our friend Ruby, so two composers, wanting to have a venue. Yeah. I'll let you, you well, I'll start and then you can <laughs> fill in once you... Be, yeah. So, so uh, the composers took the lead. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I know Ruby from our undergraduate days at Boston University. Uh, and for our senior recital, uh, we were both writing chamber operas. Um, uh, mine was a piece called A State of Affairs, and then hers was The Myth of Ur. And for our, so for the senior recital, you have to do 30 minute um, recital of your compositions. So we thought that each of our pieces were roughly 30 minutes. Um, 
why don't we do a double bill, an evening of, of, of opera uh, that's produced, and we'll work with the pe uh, people from theater, from theater arts and um, from visual arts to put together the show. Uh, so we did. And it was really fun. We had a costume designer, a lighting <coughs> designer, a set designer, uh, mostly all our friends. Um, we had an orchestra of like maybe like 10 to 12 people, wow. and uh, three, oh, five singers total in this uh, tiny uh, theater in, in, um, at BU. It was like packed and it was really fun. So afterwards, we have always talked about sustaining that and keep doing something like that. Uh, but we started going to grad school and kind of uh, left that idea for a while. And then in 2006, 2007, we revisited and said, you know, we really want to, we've always said we want to start an opera company, so let's just do it. So in uh, the fall of 2007, we started planning for this thing and um, put together a show with, uh, with just our music and we had uh, we hired Bonnie Lander and Robert Merrill to be singers in this in this thing, and we did new pieces by uh, by me and by Ruby um, in both Baltimore and Durham. That's where we were um, at that time. So so that started going, and we then just were continuing it. And then I think about three years ago, um, well, the next year after Elizabeth. Uh, we hired Elizabeth to do a piece, actually, because Bonnie couldn't yeah. make it. I'm an accidental <laughs> addition. They uh, had a show in New York, and, and Ruby uh, called me. I was like, Elizabeth, we went to college uh, together. You live in New York. Yeah. And uh, after that, I was like, now you're stuck with me. Yeah. Well, happily so. <laughs> but <laughs> what, it, the, what that leaves us with is an interesting group of, it, it we're two sopranos and a baritone, which is totally bizarre and, <laughs> and abnormal, and I think sort of, perpetually slightly frustrating for composers who see that and think, oh, well, I, and, and wind up writing, you know, a high soprano or a low soprano, which is, in a, or a soprano or a mezzo, and just, yeah. you know, flip a coin. And That's kind of the new music issue. It's yeah. like, here's my group. <laughs> right, yeah. right, exactly. right. Write us reps that only we can do. Yeah, yeah. 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 but it's a, definitely a bizarre, I think we're probably the only soprano, soprano, baritone <laughs> group in existence. Yeah, but, I mean, some interesting challenges. Yeah. Um, but, but about three, four years ago, we, we sort of formed the five people into this collective ensemble company um, that is the core of the group and is, you know, driving, driving what, what we're doing. And I bring people on, um, and also, like Zach. like Zach, Zach is playing <laughs> our orchestra. Yay. Uh, and, and, and we did a whole tour with our group and a saxophone quartet. Exactly. Which is another new music <laughs> issue. <laughs> so people had to write for four saxophones, two sopranos, yeah. and a baritone. Yeah. When you guys like something, you just really like it. Four <laughs> sopranos, four so right. saxophones. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, and and the premise of Rise with Opera is to do uh, new new opera, new vocal music, experimental vocal music, dramatic uh, opera quotes, uh, in in different spaces that are um, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do that, do that kind of work, um, and commission new works for that genre that we're still trying to define uh, in both New York and Baltimore, and have a lot of fun doing it. So I think that's, that's what we're... What Where we're, did the name Rhymes with Opera come from? Uh, George's brain. Is it I, you or I guess I came up with it. I don't know. We had a whole list of names. Names this, are so hard. This one seemed kind of cool because of like Rise of the Orange. Yeah, it's a great name. And so Rise of the Opera. Yeah. Well, and as we've expanded, it, it's gotten really exciting because we now have the rhymes with orchestra, rhymes with orchestra. <laughs> and yeah. you can just have a rhymes with anything. Yeah. Like rhymes with summer camp. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's it's no. totally. Rhymes with okay. donation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, were there any like runner-up names that you almost had? Um, Do you remember any? <laughs> music's great. Yeah. My, no, my I actually. Little opera company. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't remember. I mean, that's, gosh, that was such a long time ago, and uh -huh. we were probably inebriated, so no. <laughs> it's all great choices are made. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you should talk about the venues you played in, the, like the, at least yeah. the alternative venue idea. Yeah. I mean, part of it is, is out of necessity, you know, we, 
our, we have a growing budget and we still still small, but you know we started just bare bones and and also we so part of the necessity was like you know we didn't have access to a theater space with you know red plot with lights and house staff and all that. Um, so we're looking at how to do it in different spaces. The first model is being a band. So looking at playing as a band in different live music venues. Uh, and so yeah. that's bars and bars. And yeah. So the first concert we did was the first set of concerts we did with uh, in Durham was a place called Bull City Headquarters, which was a storefront live music venue, uh, bare bones. I mean, mm -hmm. storefront. Uh, in in a in a part of Durham, just was you know not a lot of foot traffic, and it was just kind of yeah. Um, Desolate is the word. <laughs> uh, and then the, the venue we, we did in Baltimore was uh, a place called Load of Fun, which yeah. currently I think uh, it's at, on the corner of Howard and North Avenue. Um, and it, currently I believe the building is condemned. But, <laughs> but I mean, it's a very yeah. DIY space. It's a really cool space. It's I was at that show. It's, it's yeah. kind of rough space. Right, <laughs> but it's really rough. And then, um, but we're exploring all these. Venues where where live music happens, or, you know, quote unquote live music, meaning meaning these you know bands and yeah bands and indie music would, would go. Um, and how do we make it theatrical? You know, eventually we, we went to places like bars and, and um, in Baltimore we did a lot of uh, we pretty much played exclusively in uh, what's known as the Station North Arts and Entertainment District, yeah, which is uh, a district that is focusing on uh, uh, creating more um, activity that's arts driven uh, and also then driving the economy of that of that area of, the, of, of Baltimore just north of North Avenue um, by giving opportunities for people to you know to go see uh, or to to let them know about the theaters there so you have the Fman theater um, you have the Charles theater which is a the movie theater uh, and then you have these bars and uh, Micah is having a, a, a yeah. post there now. So to sort of yeah, uh, frame all all of these places as one awesome destination to go. And so we have actually played in, in exclusively in that in that part of Baltimore, uh, which included places like Liam Flynn's, uh, which Ale is a bar, House. Ale House, uh, the Wine Up Space, which is now this just awesome uh, music venue with a nice bar and yeah. seating. And, stage. Um, Metro, Gallery. Metro Gallery is an awesome flexible space that we've played twice now in. I really like um, that pizza place in Durham that we played. Oh, uh, that's yeah. Broad Street Cafe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Also a really great live music venue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were they were just like, sure, go for it. But I don't think they really had any idea what we were doing. <laughs> no, but they. I feel like they kind of like embody what you guys are, what are, are into because it, they're like a pizza shop. That has yeah. a stage on one side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, that's true. And that was that's like a, that was a stage. Stage lights. Like, you're like, we don't care if that's unusual. This yeah. is just what we want to do. So those are the kind of venues. And then the upcoming concerts we have next week uh, in Brooklyn. We're playing in Bobville Park, which is uh, another storefront venue uh, that has had a lot of experimental music in it. So we're doing a little more theatrical stuff, ringing lights and uh, working with the director and. Uh, trying to make it more of a show, uh, and then also in Baltimore we're playing at, playing at 2640, which is this former church, uh, just giant that space, awesome. that's sort of, uh, not crumbling is not the word, but like very, um, yeah, and very states of very beautiful decay, I mean the, the walls are, it's cool. uh, yeah, a little it's crumbling, and, and, but it's, it's a beautiful space. So, I think in the future, you know, hopefully, uh, uh, wherever we go, we're trying to make more of a, more theater uh, now as we kind of grow the company, as opposed to yeah. a band. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Um, has all your experience in working in Rhymes with Opera changed the way you write music? Um. I mean, you you're a fantastic writer for for The Voice, and I okay. I mean it's totally possible that you were like that before <laughs> and that you just have the natural ability but but I I just assume that the you fact know, that you you work with singers you respect <clears throat> us yeah. you you listen to us you know our voices but you you really write you know and it's it's both beautiful and interesting but also really healthy which we yeah. appreciate 
<laughs> yeah, I, I was know. thinking, like, do you have a behind the scenes experience? You know, like, is this yeah. going to be fun to rehearse? Yeah. Is this going to be practical yeah. to do what that group's doing? Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, no, in, in that way, yes. I mean, I have worked with this, the same group of singers and just singing in general for the past, gosh, I mean, like eight years. So, and I do like to please, <laughs> I aim to please. Um, <laughs> And so when I when people tell me about what works for the voice, um, I I do want to create something that is fun to sing and and but also is fun for me to listen to in that in the way that like it, it it's interesting to me you know um, and also I think my work with American Opera Projects I spent a year doing this residency yeah. program with them uh, where was that I in Boston with, it was in New York in Brooklyn. Um, okay. And you know, I worked with over the course of nine months, worked with six different singers, writing a song for them roughly three weeks apart. Um, every three weeks, giving them a new song uh, for each voice, each fa. Uh, so it was that was, uh, all of that. I mean, I think helped me um, write write better for the voice uh, as I go on. And uh, I started writing for voice. In college, because you know, with with my um, with my teacher, um, first teacher, Charles Fussell, and I think he's a he's a great mentor to me, and he's he 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 was, he's uh, has always been very excited about the voice and is very smart about the voice, and he's a person that really turned me on to, you know, really using speech rhythm and prosody and text setting to uh, bring out certain things about the English language in terms of in, in terms of music, which I really enjoy. Um, but, you know, th that's just one aspect of, of writing for voice. I mean, I know other composers don't take that as a sort of more salient quality. It's more about some other thing. But for me, uh, you know, the idea of this, um, of setting English in particular in an interesting way that is uh, readily understandable, yeah. uh, I think it's really important to me. Um, and so people like Charles and, and composers like uh, um, Benjamin Britten is really helpful for me, you know, because I, I really appreciate that. So all of those things, and Rhymes with Opera, I think has helped me, you know, think more about uh, opera. But you know, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, counting out that I would do something crazy that you would hate <laughs> in a few years. I, I we'll might see. hate it, but it probably wouldn't give me like, you know, a Lorenzo spasm. Hopefully not. Yeah. I trust you, George. Um, we pretty much focused on opera and, and theatrical music. But are, are you interested in writing other stuff, or is that really what you're doing um, about it right now? You yeah, do choral. Yeah, You've done, I mean, a choral, maybe it's in a similar vein, but... Well, we, we had a sax quartet piece, so it's pretty That's distant right. from That's the right. Right. Yeah, so I, I have, like, two, two different kind of things that I like, I mean, amongst other categories. But uh, one is just dramatic music and opera and, and documentary, all in the same. The other one is sort of this more static sound uh, of a static drone, like a slow changing drone. Um, so this saxophone quartet that I wrote for the Red Clay Saxophone Quartet based in Greensboro uh, that uh, Zach and the AMPM Quartet has performed a few times. Yeah, um, yeah it's this, uh, there's eight minutes in the first movement of just concert C. Um, <laughs> well, no, yeah. <laughs> and, and it was uh, everyone doing different uh, yeah, I mean, entrances and, and releases on C, <laughs> uh, all written out. And then the second movement was this uh, tone row that, that uh, wound its way up to the altissimo yeah. for about 30 seconds. Um, so it was kind of conceptual, but I mean, I, uh, it was, it was, that's another kind of music that I enjoy writing. Yeah. Uh, I really like the yeah. drone stuff. Yeah. Like that, that's something that you have in the piece for us. This, this is several movements where I'm just oscillating two notes mm -hmm. and maybe changing. And um, what was the title of your recent piece with Rhymes with Opera? The Mary Flagler the Fairy? The love yeah. song with Mary Flagler Fairy. That Perry. begins with like just these just chords. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is neat. I mean, it's, it's like a really bold characteristic, just being like, this is all I need yeah. to yeah. do what I'm doing with my music. Yeah. It's just this sound. Well, and that for that it's a trio, and you'll you can if I just do that and just the viola is droning, you'll hear the words. You'll hopefully hear the three That's voices true. doing more. Uh, and the piece for you guys, the drone idea and the slow changing idea was in the second movement or the first chapter with that um, in the tape part. There's this detuned 
uh, saxophone. Oh, uh, that would be more of a drum. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's a, a drone. I mean, that's what I, you know, that's completely in line with what I, you know, I've been trying to think more about um, uh, microtones, not in terms of sense and in terms of... Um, sense being the acoustic measurement. Yeah, of, of, of not minute... sense. No, <laughs> Z-E-N-T-S. Of, uh, yeah. of the small uh, increments of uh, pitch or, or uh, so like, or quarter tones or spectral, which is another way of thinking about sense. Um, so, I mean, I, I was thinking about more uh, um, glissando, of a slow glissando, mm -hmm. and getting microtones that way. And, you know, because there's something about a slow, very, very slow glissando uh, that, that lets you hear the sound completely differently. You know, it's, it's, you keep hearing these different pitches uh, that you don't, you don't think about. And uh, also the idea is to, well, uh, how do I do that for instruments or ensembles that don't really do that? For example, you know, how do I write a piece that is a, a study in a slow glissando for an orchestra? Uh, and how do you do that with <coughs> instruments that don't really do that, like certain wind instruments? Or So I, I wrote this orchestra piece about a year ago um, that I was trying to do do that with. You know, it has like a, it has like a siren, a crank, hand crank siren oh, okay. in, the, in the percussion section that was like at Mesa Forte, so it's just all kind of like, mm. but yeah. like, you know, have the, this, yeah, the wash of this like muted strings, you know. So I, I never heard it, so I <laughs> hope that works. But that, that's the, that's the kind of, but that drone idea in your piece is, uh, is this other side that I, I, I'm interested in. What's the process like when you're writing a piece? Are you at the piano or yeah. Um, yeah. how do you sort of structure it in the beginning? Uh, well, I walk around a lot and then yeah. <laughs> when I had time to walk around. <laughs> you have a dog, no, so I have a dog. Yeah. that's an excuse. Or I work when I, I'm tired of emailing. Um, uh, I'll, I'll think about, you know. I'll think about how, so I mean, but that is to say, all joking aside, there's a lot of thinking, I think, that pre-compositional thinking that is due, uh, that would make the process easier and then more decisive when you actually put ink to page. Um, and so, but yeah, generally I just sit at the piano and, and play around with stuff and write things down on, on paper. Um, and I, I, I would sketch and then I would go back and rewrite it. <laughs> And then, um, and then I would once I get through to a double bar, and then I would put in Sibelius, and then rework it from there. You know, completely add things, subtract things. Um, I mean, yeah. just so I, I would like to say half the work is probably on Sibelius, and half the work is at the piano. You also play violin. Do you ever, yeah. Do you ever right. mess around that way, or is not it really. not as not yeah. much of a thing? Yeah. Like, <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. Well, it's hard to play and then, like, pick yeah. up, put down the bow and pick up the yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, did you study piano and violin at a younger age? Yeah, I started piano when I was six, and I added violin when I was, like, I don't know, seven or eight, something like that. But uh, it wasn't until I moved to Boston when I was 12. Um, I was born in Hong Kong, and I moved to Boston when I was 12. Uh, it wasn't until I moved to Boston that I started studying violin with a private teacher and actually mm -hmm somewhat serious about it, um, but... When did you start writing music? Uh, well, I started writing music in high school. Uh, <clears throat> I was always, I was, in the, I was in the school band, and I was always interested in arranging the music for the band, and thinking about arrangements. Um, I was always interested with all the other instruments, and not really interested in practicing. Um, <laughs> So then you're supposed to be a composer. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. So I always want to just learn like another instrument. And my dear to were like, you know, you're not really that good at the trombone yet. Well, like, uh, the clarinet looks cool. I'll find a clarinet. Um, so and then in high school, I started taking a class um, at the New England Conservatory Preparatory School mm -hmm. in uh, in composition. It was a group composition seminar. And I wrote the cheesiest music, it was just, <laughs> but it was fun, it was really great. Uh, and then and then I started music education at BU, but then uh, actually Ruby, uh, who started as a violin performance major, 
uh, started writing music and was thinking about majoring in that, uh, double majoring in that, so I thought I would too, you know, because that sounded really interesting. <laughs> also, um, side note, BU is expensive, so I really wanted to get my money's worth and get two degrees, mm -hmm. or two, whatever. <laughs> so. And then you and Ruby both wound up getting master's degrees at Peabody. Uh, she got her master's at San Francisco Conservatory of Music. And I got my master's Peabody. at Peabody, yeah. And that, yeah, so. Uh, also at Peabody, I forced myself to get two degrees, because it was also expensive. <laughs> so what are you forcing yourself to do two things up now? Um, Have a job. Well, he has a full-time job, company. and yeah. he runs an opera company, so that's true. and yeah. he composes. Well, it's actually barely. three. It's barely composing these days, but yeah. Uh, I'm working on this piece for Mike Compatello and his trio, The yeah. Morse Code. Um, and it's, uh, it's a documentary piece that starts with us interviewing different expats um, in living in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, exploring what they think about home and what home means and uh, working that into a trio for percussion, viola, and cello. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, yeah. everyone should come next week to see Rams with Opera play. Or look up uh, YouTube to see the video of it if I if I ever post it. If it yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you should go well, now. Go now. Yeah. Go now. Just search for Rise of Opera. <laughs> uh, cool. cool. Thanks so much, Thanks, George. George. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right.